are good to go, let me invite uh, Tony to come back and give his remarks. Please, a hand of applause once again. Good morning, and uh, apologies for that slight delay. Um, I am, my name is Tony Banbury. I'm the president of the International Foundation for Electoral Systems, and very honored to be here with this distinguished group. Uh, Madam Chair Zulumis, uh, Chairwoman of the Election Commission of Zambia, Vice Chair, uh, distinguished commissioners, uh, justices, judges, uh, excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, uh, thank you so much for joining us for this important conversation today. Um, I'd like to first start by congratulating uh, Zambia on the important role it is fulfilling as a co-host of the Summit for Democracy with events taking place not just in Lusaka but also uh, Seoul, South Korea, in Costa Rica, in the Netherlands. Uh, these are very important events taking place uh, and I have never seen seen uh, Zambia so much in the news in the United States before I got here at least. So uh, it's really inspiring to see uh, Zambia playing such a leading role in uh, talking about the challenges facing democracy and what we all need to do uh, to address those challenges. And that's what we'll be doing today here as well. Um, the, the world we know is changing rapidly in so many ways. Uh, new threats to democracy. Uh, it's no longer the case uh, where there are uh, developed democracies that have addressed the problems. Uh, in, in fact, it never really was the case where uh, developed democracies had uh, uh, solved their So I guess it is working. <laughs> I won't start from the beginning, but to, uh, to everyone who is joining us online, please excuse the uh, technical uh, difficulty that we encountered at the start of this session. Hopefully you're all able to see and, and hear us. Um, and, and so uh, another um, uh, important change in the world, we, we see these challenges uh, that countries like the United States are facing in its democracy, very serious challenges. We also see uh, real strengths uh, in the democracy of countries like Zambia and, and countries around the world. So a a any democracy is by definition imperfect and has challenges. Uh, every democracy approaches its uh, electoral systems, its constitutional system, in a, it, with uh, different approaches. There's no right or wrong. Uh, we all can learn from each other. We can all support each other. That is especially true now with the impact of technology on, on society, on democracy, and on elections. Uh, we see rapid technological innovation, but unfortunately that innovation is often used for nefarious purposes to undermine uh, democracy, to undermine the trust that voters have in their elections. Uh, this is presenting, I think, one of the gravest threats, uh, not just to electoral integrity, but to social cohesion in democracies around the world. The rapid spread of misinformation, disinformation, the new methods that are being used uh, in order to uh, spread that kind of news. There are uh, companies that sell services uh, to spread disinformation. There are interested parties willing to pay for that to undermine uh, a voter's understanding in uh, the uh, electoral environment or to challenge the role of an election commission. We see it again and again in countries around the world. Uh, the impact of artificial intelligence, we see it in the news every day now, that is going to uh, change so much of the uh, way we interact with technology and I think will have a huge impact on uh, elections uh, and the information space. 
So those of us uh, committed to democracy, committed to electoral integrity, like everyone here in this room and, and gathered uh, on, online, uh, we have to work together, uh, learn from each other, uh, and identify what these challenges are, how technology is threatening democracy and election integrity, and what we can do about it, how we can deploy technology to strengthen democracy and strengthen electoral integrity, improve the information environment. And that's what we're going to be discussing today. None of us can do it alone. No uh, government, no election commission, no technology company, certainly no non-governmental organization such as IFAS. However, together, working together, we can each bring something very valuable to the table and uh, contribute to developing these kinds of solutions. And I'm very grateful to uh, all our partners, the Election Commission of Zambia. We have also here the, the Carter Center, uh, USAID, uh, thanks to USAID's uh, generosity, uh, IFAS is able to work here in Zambia. But we'll also be joined by uh, colleagues from Microsoft and Google who are uh, very important partners in this broader effort and for IFAS as an organization. And so uh, I want to uh, thank all our partners for this work, but we have a very, very difficult road ahead of us. Uh, the, uh, the technology is changing at a faster pace and being deployed for nefarious purposes at a faster pace than thus far democracy advocates have been able to keep up with. So we must move at a much faster pace. Uh, we are uh, going to be talking about how to do that today. IFAS has been trying to do our part. We worked with the um, uh, IEBC in Kenya and the INEC in Nigeria recently to deploy an artificial intelligence tool um, to track hate speech online uh, targeted at uh, different uh, social groups so the um, election commission could see uh, around the election in uh, Kenya in August and uh, that Nigeria just had so the election commission could understand that uh, hate speech environment online. Um, we are also working uh, in the election integrity cohort part of the Summit for Democracy with the Election Commission of India uh, to get a commitment to develop voluntary guidelines for social media companies to use around elections, and we hope to help that election commissions from around the world in the months ahead following the summit. So there's lots happening, but we have to do much more, and I'll stop there so we can hear from those who are doing this work that is going to be, I think, so valuable for us in our effort to secure, defend, and promote democracy and electoral integrity. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Anthony Bunbury. They are setting the tone for our discussions uh, this morning. One key takeaway is the fact that he's talked about cooperation as we are all in a global village. At this point, allow me to invite Mark Bellera, Acting Director, Democracy, Human Rights, and Governance, USAID. But before he comes, again, I'll just quickly read through his bio. So Mark is Acting Director of Center for Democracy, Human Rights, and Governance. He previously served as Deputy Director of Southern Africa in the Africa Bureau. He previously also held roles across the sub-region on full range of issues relating to foreign assistance. In 2018, he served as Director for African Affairs at the National Security Council. Earlier, he was Senior Democracy and Governance Advisor at USAID Zimbabwe and the Regional Coordinator for Africa in the DRG Center. Belera has a Bachelor of Art from the Duke University in Political Science and Economics and a Master of Art in Political Science from the University of California, Los Angeles. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome Mark Belera.
expand on things too. Um, a, and of course, I must recognize the global leadership of ICAS um, in the long-standing partnership between our two organizations. As this audi audience already knows, the growing use of technology creates significant security risks, including cyber attacks, which often come across borders from those attempting to interfere in elections and undermine democratic processes. Some of this will sound familiar to, to those in the audience who joined the Carter Center event yesterday. Um, cyber attacks can result in breaches of voter privacy. They can lead to manipulation of election outcomes. They can disenfranchise voters. They can damage election, election administration's reputations, undermine an entire process, and ultimately decrease public trust. Further, the increasing use of social media in elections brings greater vulnerability to manipulation of the information environment. And digital technolo technologies increase the scale, reach, and precision of disinformation campaigns, dramatically exacerbating the impact. Gendered disinformation, especially towards female candidates, is a particularly pernicious problem. We unfortunately see this everywhere, in Africa, in the United States, all over. Governments, election management bodies, candidates, and parties are often ill-equipped to prepare for, respond to um, uh, cybersecurity attacks and disinformation campaigns. So what can we do? While these challenges are significant, they're not insurmountable. We can work together regionally and globally to engage on technological threats to democracy and election integrity. Indeed, that is one of the reasons we've gathered here today. Over the past few years, USAID's Center for Democracy, Human Rights, and Governance, with the help of IFAS and DAI, has worked diligently to strengthen our own knowledge of cybersecurity in elections and ultimately better integrate electoral uh, cybersecurity strategies into our own programming. We are also looking outward. Sustained cooperation among global electoral integrity state stakeholders is urgently needed. USAID is supporting this global community through its membership in the Global Network for Securing Electoral Integrity, GNSEI, pronounced so you'll hear this, GenSEG, which launched last week to a global audience online. The network brings together key election organizations around a shared vision to inspire and inform action and advance electoral integrity in the face of critical threats to democracy. GenSEG has established a broad-based platform to develop, advance, and promote adherence to norms, guiding principles, and codes of conduct that address emerging and long-term threats to electoral integrity. Over the past year, USAID has worked collectively with more than 30 international organizations, intergovernmental organizations, development agencies, and election networks to develop the global network. Already, 19 leading organizations and networks have become official participants, including IFAS. Um, seven others have become observers, and five subject matter experts have joined. That's just the start. The network recognizes that we all must work together to advocate for, reinforce, and encourage updates to election norms, make elections more inclusive, and take actions to advance electoral integrity globally. This will help ensure elections reflect the will of all people. In closing, the more we come together as an electoral integrity community to address these shared challenges, the more likely we are to come up with sustainable solutions and be able to adapt to the changing realities. I look forward to hearing from our panelists and discussing these topics with you all Thank you. Thank you very much, Mark Bilera there, Acting Director, DRJ Center, USAID, simply highlighting the scale and reach of the threats that we are dealing with, but obviously equally emphasizing the importance of cooperation. We'll be getting into the keynote address, uh, ladies and gentlemen, but uh, before I invite our keynote uh, speaker, allow me to give you a profile of the Electoral Commission of Zambia Chairperson, Madam Mwangala Zalomes. Mrs. Zalomes holds various academic qualifications that include social work and law. She was admitted to the Zambian Bar in 1990, that's December, and during her 32 years illustrious career, she has demonstrated strong understanding and experience in electoral processes and constitutional making. In course of her illustrious legal career, she has worked in various public and private sector 
organizations. Having chaired the Energy Regulation Board, she's also served on the National Constitution Conference, as well as the Constitution of Zambia Drafting uh, Committee. And on 8th March 2021, to mark International Women's Day, Mrs. Zalomes was honored among 100 women in Africa as a courtroom male. I was actually asking her about courtroom male because these are uh, terms that are only understood by um, people from the legal fraternity, the honorable justices in the house. I can see Vice Chairperson uh, Ambassador Alice Menga smiling, and obviously this is making sense for him, but we'll know about this a little later. So this was uh, for her outstanding work in the courts of law. She chaired the Electoral Reform Technical Committee, whose recommendations became part of the democratic governance in the Constitution. Ladies and gentlemen, the chairperson of the Electoral Commission of Zambia. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I'm delighted, actually, to, to be here and to give the keynote speech, because I think this is one of the most momentous times just before the summit, or as a sideline to the summit, we are able to do this with the compliments of IFES. Honorable Lady Justice and Sitali, is representing the Chief Justice, Honorable Justice Martin Musaluke, representing the President of the Constitutional Court, the Electoral Commission of Mauritius, Mr. Muhammad Enfa Abdul Rahman. You know, this gentleman, I think, is one of the longest serving commissioners in Africa. He's been a commissioner for 25 years. <laughs> Let's give him a hand. Uh, the chairperson of the Electoral Commission of Zambia, Mrs. Elsie Njikembwa, the IFES president and CEO, Mr. Mike Banbury, USID Acting Director, Center for, for Democracy, Human Rights and Governance, Mr. Mark Bilera, cooperating partners, political parties, uh, political um, leaders present here, members and staff of the Electoral Commission of Zambia, the media, distinguished ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of the Electoral Commission of Zambia, I wish to welcome you all to this event which is being held on the peripheral of the second summit for democracy, being co-hosted by the governments of the Republic of Zambia, the United States of America, and other countries. Under the theme, free, fair, and transparent elections in Africa as a foundation for democracy. The summit offers an opportunity for Zambia as co-host and the Electoral Commission of Zambia to interact and share experiences with other like-mindedness stakeholders on strategies of obtaining free, fair, and transparent elections, as well as enhancing the electoral process. The Electoral Commission of Zambia is delighted to have this opportunity to partner with International Foundation for Electoral Systems to host this very important event, networking event, which has brought together stakeholders who include election management bodies, government representatives, cooperating partners, the civil society, media and election practitioners. I also wish to extend my appreciation to all, you, to all of you, our local, regional, global stakeholders for taking time to attend to this important event. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, this side event has been called to deliberate on innovative strategies to combat threats to election integrity. 
the Electoral Commission recognizes the need to uphold high standards of integrity in elections. Since the return to multi-party democracy, Zambia has conducted seven general elections, two presidential elections, and managed three peaceful elections transitions in 1991 to 2021. You might be surprised why we are saying general elections and two presidential elections. At that time, the Constitution provided that if the president, uh, if there's a demise of the presidency, of the president in the presidency, you had to hold a general um, a presidential election. And this was held on two occasions. And this has already has been rectified with a majoritarian system of electing a president, which is now in the Constitution, where the president has a running mate. So the running mate takes over in case of that eventuality. Today we seek to deliberate and explore, among other issues, the current state of threats facing our various countries, such as law institutional trust, cyber attacks, disinformation, and misinformation. The meeting is also expected to derive valuable insights from our various electoral experiences and highlight specific innovative strategies, including for regional coordination and the deployment of cutting edge technology. Election integrity is critical to any electoral process for, election to, for elections to reflect the will of the people. Maintaining and upholding a conducive electoral environment calls for concerted efforts from various stakeholders and adherence to the rule of law. To this effect, Zambia has in place a robust electoral legal framework, and I'm sure Judge Sitali knows all about this because she's been part of this legal framework for a very long time, including the electoral code of conduct to guide the conduct of all stakeholders in the electoral process and manage stakeholder, stakeholders that violate the electoral code of conduct. I know this is a very difficult uh, uh, challenge function to try and hold to try and hold people accountable to electoral misconduct. Historically, Zambia has been known to be a peaceful country. However, during the period leading to the 2021 general election, the country experienced cases of violence arising from heightened political competition among political players. And I'm aware that we lost lives because of this. This is how serious it was. The Electoral Commission has in place conflict management mechanisms, which have proved to be helpful in resolving minor electoral disputes and conflicts. In addition, the courts of law have played a significant role in election dispute resolution. And we say thank you, judges, for a job well done. The commission, takes the commission takes proactive stance by collaborating with law enforcement agencies in enforcing the Electoral Code of Conduct. Further, the commission has identified some gaps in the electoral legal framework that would resolve some of the challenges and enhance the participation of groups such as women, youth, and persons living with disability. The Commission re also recognizes and takes seriously observations and recommendations made by various stakeholders in the electoral process, which once implemented would enhance the integrity of the elections. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, enhancing access to electoral services is paramount to electoral integrity. Prior to the 2021 general election, the commission conducted delimitation of electoral boundaries, which increased the number of polling stations and reduced distances that the electorate had to cover to access polling stations. 
the commission also had to exercise affirmative action by lowering the nomination fees that women, the youth, and persons with disabilities had to pay. In order to further enhance election integrity, the commission is making progress towards inclusive, inclusiveness by ensuring that measures are put in place to make electoral services more accessible to persons with disability, women and the youth. Further, during 2021 general elections, persons in lawful custody, correctional facilities, which are correctional facilities, were registered as voters and voted for the first time in the history of Zambia, and they're still voting, and they voted in the seven by-election ward elections that, we are, that we've had and we are going to have. So the, this is a continuous process, and they're still voting. In conclusion, I would like to once again thank you for all coming, for all of you, for coming to this event. As a commission, we value your partnership at every level as it has a positive impact on our electoral process. We look forward to the fruitful deliberations and networking during this meeting and beyond. I thank you and I wish you enjoyable deliberations. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chairperson of the Electoral Commission of Zambia, Mrs. Mwangala Zalumis, giving us the keynote address. And some of the issues highlighted there include the key history of elections in Zambia. She also touched on legal issues and particularly the legal framework that includes uh, the Electoral Code of Conduct. She also touched another interesting and very uh, topical area, which is inclusion and accessibility in terms of women, youth, and persons with disabilities participation in the electoral process. But also she highlighted the importance of stakeholder engagement and involvement in the process. Right now, ladies and gentlemen, we are transitioning into the presentations. And to begin this, um, the first presentation, allow me to just give a brief bio for the first presenter, who's no other than Mr. Bob Mwelwa Musenga, Acting Chief Electoral Officer, Electoral Commission of Zambia. So Mr. Mwelwa was appointed Commission Secretary in February 2018, and currently serving as Ch Acting Chief Electoral Officer, as I earlier mentioned. A law graduate from the University of Zambia and University of Aberdeen in the United Kingdom, Mr. Msenga also holds a Master of Science in Electoral Policy and Administration from Santana School of Advanced Studies in Italy. He was admitted as an advocate of the High Court of Zambia in November 1996 and has over 20 years of experience as a legal practitioner. He currently chairs the Legal Committee of the Electoral Commission's Forum of SADC Countries, a forum for electoral management bodies in the SADC region. Ladies and gentlemen, let's welcome Mr. Msenga as he gives us an overview of threats to electoral integrity that's the Zambian experience. Mr. Msenga. Thank you. Director of uh, Madam Director of Program, I will beg leave that uh, I ride on the protocols already adopted, and uh, mine is not a, a speech; it's a short presentation. You'll be able to uh, follow the presentation. So, in terms of the the topic that uh, we're looking at, this is an overview of threats to electoral integrity. And of course, uh, this is with specific reference to our country, 
uh, Zambia. In terms of the outline, we'll have a very brief introduction, then look at the legal framework, and then uh, we'll take time to look at the strides made towards uh, electoral integrity and uh, look at uh, uh, some possible threats to electoral integrity and then make some ref reflections. So the Constitution of the Republic of Zambia establishes the Electoral Commission of Zambia as an independent electoral management body amongst others to conduct elections. And since the return to multi-party politics, Zambia's democracy has relatively remained stable and has consistently held periodic elections, and these are held every five years. So general elections have since been held in 1991, 96, 2001, 2006, 2011, 2016, and the last uh, general election, which was the seventh one, was held in uh, August 2021. And we also have had uh, presidential elections in uh, 2008 and uh, 2015. The chairperson had uh, alluded to uh, explain why we had those presidential elections, because with the current constitution, uh, that has uh, changed. And so those elections were held after the death of the incumbent uh, uh, president. And then it is worthy note that uh, to observe that uh, Zambia has managed democratic transition of power in 1991, 2011, and uh, 2020. In terms of the legal framework, our elections are guided and supported by a comprehensive legal framework, and uh, these being the Constitution of Zambia, in specific reference to the Amendment Act Number no. 2 of 2016. There was an amendment in, 19, in 2016. And of course, the Electoral Commission of Zambia Act Number no. 25 of 2016. And uh, there was an amendment, there is an Amendment Act Number no. 5 of 2019. And then, of course, the Electoral Process Act number uh, 35 of 2016 and the Amendment Act number 32 of 2021. And of course, uh, there are regulations that are uh, made pursuant to the Electoral uh, Process Act, and these speak to the detailed uh, uh, regulations. In terms of the strides made to enhance electoral integrity, the first point to note is that uh, fresh voter registration was uh, conducted in 2020, and this captured a total of uh, 7 million, uh, 23,499 uh, voters. And uh, that, uh, in terms of uh, gender, we have uh, that translates to three million seven hundred and fifty one thousand and forty females and then uh, three million two hundred and seventy two uh, thousand and four hundred and uh, fifty nine uh, males and uh, this was out of a total target of uh, eight point four eligible uh, voters again one of the key strides uh, to enhance electoral integrity uh, was the conversion of streams to polling stations, and this was aimed at uh, enhancing efficiency and transparency in the counting uh, uh, procedures. And then uh, another stride that was made to enhance uh, uh, electoral integrity uh, relates to the possibility um, of uh, persons in law of custody or in correctional facilities uh, who were uh, able to register as voters and they actually voted for the first time in the history of um, our country during the last general uh, election. And this trend has 
continued in uh, the by-elections that have been held after, after the, the, the general election. Of course, I should be quick to point out that uh, um, this position came via a, a, a directive by the constitutional court that uh, all persons, uh, including those who are in law of custody, must be eligible to uh, be registered as voters and indeed also uh, uh, vote. Uh, again, at, uh, talking to the strides made to enhance the electoral integrity, it is worthy to note that uh, the voter turnout in the 2021 general election uh, was 70.32%. Uh, and uh, again, it is uh, important to take notice that uh, the commission timely announced the presidential uh, results within uh, 69 hours. And uh, this was against uh, a set target of uh, 72 hours. And uh, it is also important to note that uh, the last general election was conducted uh, under a very stringent uh, uh, COVID-19 uh, uh, situation, uh, but uh, it was uh, nevertheless uh, successively uh, conducted. And then also, the, the, we have a generally peaceful uh, by-elections post the 2021 general um, uh, elections, and there has been enhanced participation of uh, uh, stakeholders, there was enhanced participation of stakeholders during the 2021 general election, and uh, in fact, uh, the monitors and uh, observers uh, 3D participated, as uh, is evident by the, uh, the reports, or indeed the feedback that uh, we got. We've looked at the, the strides. I need to point out that um, it was not, uh, 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 it was, uh, uh, we, we still had uh, uh, some um, challenges. And at this stage, I would want to speak to some of the threats to electoral integrity. And the first issue is, of course, uh, uh, relates to the application of the Public Order Act that has uh, often been perceived to stifle political party uh, uh, campaigns. But you may wish to know that, um, uh, in fact, they are planned to uh, amend uh, uh, same. And of course, uh, the other uh, threat that uh, we witnessed was the lack of adherence to the electoral code of conduct by uh, political party uh, stakeholders. And then uh, we had unprecedented electoral petitions arising from the 2021 general uh, election. For instance, we had uh, 84 parliamentary uh, petitions. And uh, besides that, we also had, uh, over, uh, we had uh, 272 local government uh, 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 petitions. And so uh, the number was clearly and uh, the heightened uh, political uh, competition um, had mad, uh, uh, was mad by politically motivated uh, violence, and in some instances, this prompted the commission to suspend or bar some of the candidates from uh, uh, campaigning. Uh, the other threats that uh, we can uh, speak to in relation to electoral integrity would be the low confidence levels of the institution among uh, some uh, stakeholders and uh, the clear pluralized media landscape with the traditional and new media reporting along political party lines. And uh, we've also noticed that uh, there's been increased misinformation and uh, cyberbullying through uh, various uh, uh, media 
uh, channels. And uh, the commissions ICT-based innovative systems such as the Electro Support Center, the voter verification uh, devices. Again, uh, 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 some of the stakeholders have not uh, uh, totally uh, embraced uh, some of these uh, innovative uh, systems, but I'm sure uh, this is a topical uh, matter that uh, we will be interrogated at this uh, uh, forum. And also, uh, we have had uh, um, uh, instances of uh, uh, cyber attacks. Now, where do we stand? Instead of uh, uh, some of the issues that um, as the commission we are uh, reflecting on would be matters like uh, the legal precedents that uh, will uh, influence the future electoral uh, processes. The 2016 constitution that I made uh, reference to as um, a number of uh, provisions that uh, uh, would require interpretations from time to time. But uh, uh, the Constitutional Court has uh, helped us uh, in a number of uh, instances, and uh, there are certain uh, matters that uh, were gray areas, but they have uh, since clarified. One issue that comes to mind is uh, uh, the qualification, contentious qualification, grade 12 uh, qualifications, clarity has uh, been made, and also uh, I've made reference to the fact that uh, the persons in law custody are able to, to vote again, that again thanks to the Constitutional Court that uh, interpreted uh, uh, the law. Uh, there is uh, one of the issues that uh, we are again uh, giving serious thought to is the need to extend uh, a voting franchise possibly to persons in the diaspora. Of course, that is a matter that can only conclusively be done after making necessary uh, stakeholder consultations. And also, the use of um, ICT in elections, uh, which presents uh, both a threat and an opportunity to the uh, electoral uh, process. Again, this is um, uh, a matter where you can only take a position after making necessary stakeholder uh, consultation. So uh, these and uh, many other issues uh, uh, would have a direct impact on uh, electoral uh, integrity. To conclude, uh, the discussion. It is important to note that uh, the Electoral Commission of Zambia has uh, continued to make strides in discharging its uh, constitutional mandate uh, in ensuring that it delivers uh, a free, fair, and transparent uh, elections. And uh, uh, of course, uh, electoral integrity is. Uh, central to elections, and uh, therefore, as uh, an electoral management body, we will continuously uh, seek to adapt ways uh, of enhancing the integrity of the electoral process. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Acting CEO, for that presentation. At this point, ladies and gentlemen, allow me to just make an announcement of uh, a matter just received. The okay, thank you. I'm being signaled uh, to to hold for now. We will go into the next presentation right now, and this will be coming to us virtually. We'll be joined by David Lightman who's director corporate civic responsibility from Microsoft. So just to test, um, Dave, say hello, if you are able to, to hear me. 
I'm here. Can you hear me? Great. So let me just quickly go through your bio. So as part of the company's Democracy Forward program, Dave runs civic engagement efforts and works with election officials worldwide to address tech and security needs. Lightman also leads the company's internal US and international election strategy. Dave, over to you for the presentation. Thank you very much. Um, I'm coming to you live from my basement in Washington, DC, uh, so that I don't wake up my kids. It's very early here. <laughs> um, I want to thank uh, IFAS and uh, Mr. Commissioner, Madam Chair, for allowing us to uh, address the crowd today. Uh, much appreciated. Um, are you guys uh, looking at my slides right now? No? Okay, here we go. All right, uh, as she said, my name is Dave Legman. Uh, I'm the Director of Corporate Civic Responsibility for Microsoft's Democracy Forward Initiative. Um, and I put it up there uh, at D. Lightman um, on Twitter. If you if you uh, need to contact me, you can follow through IFAS or uh, DM me on Twitter, that's fine. Um, so you're probably asking yourself, why is Microsoft here? What does Microsoft do in this space? Why, why do we care about elections? Um, generally, it is in the best interest of large corporations like ourselves to protect democracy. And that's kind of one of the big themes of the Summit for Democracy this week. Um, democracy is good for business. We, we thrive, our business thrives when democracy thrives. Uh, something like 97% of our company's revenue comes from democratic countries. But more than that, and this is a theme of this week, uh, in fact, there was a big round table um, in Washington, DC yesterday on business and democracy. And uh, something that I heard was fantastic. It was democracy is good for business, but it's important that business be good for democracy as well. And so that kind of drives everything we do um, at Microsoft is to say that we know we benefit from democracy. We know we benefit from democratic ideals and stability and economics. And therefore it is not just necessary, but right and proper that we return the favor, that, that we exercise our own resources in the protection of democracy. So our mission is to preserve, protect and advance the fundamentals of democracy, which we consider a fundamental human right. Um, and we do that uh, by promoting a healthy information ecosystem, and safeguarding electoral processes. Um, next slide. And so we we consider the whole the whole of democracy when uh, how we protect it. Um, a lot of times we we get hung up on the threats to democracy, meaning, and we treat cybersecurity as the only threat to democracy. And it's a big threat to democracy, right? And and that's kind of the reason that a lot of these discussions happen and, and but it's important to consider the whole of democracy when protecting it. And so we we deal with it in in three streams and we, we tell them so all sides of the same coin. Um, open and secure democratic processes. So our group works really hard to uh, protect electoral integrity and maintain critical institution security um, in the US and abroad. And uh, Matt here in the room is actually going to tell you a lot more about our efforts uh, with IFAS and with Google and others um, to work to uh, safeguard your elections and, and others. Um, we talk a lot about a healthy information ecosystem. Um, there's a, a, a lot of pieces to this. I mean, disinformation is probably the number one threat um, to elections currently, but maintaining a healthy information ecosystem is also critical to combating that in the long term and as a society, building societal resilience. So we talk a lot about um, the need for information literacy and media literacy, uh, helping helping uh, increase media literacy among children, among adults, uh, and how they consume media. Um, we also talk about preserving journalism. We have a huge program that works to um, rebuild newsrooms where local news has fallen apart um, because of you know the internet and modern technology it's become very difficult for local news but local news is critical to democracy um, and we also talk about corporate civic responsibility so 
Um, so that's that looks like civics education, and and we treat civics as a national security imperative at Microsoft. Um, I think we saw it. You guys have had your own difficulties in Zambia. I think we've seen it in a lot of places all over the world, most recently in Brazil uh, a few weeks ago. But in the U.S. just two years ago, we had our own experience of what happens when a large portion of our population um, lacks fundamental knowledge about how their government operates. And so uh, we spend a lot of our time uh, promoting civics education, working to uh, increase the civic uh, capacity of our society. Um, next slide. And so we do that, you know, I, again, I, I sit here as a representative of Microsoft. Microsoft is a technology company, right? So we look at how we can leverage what we have internally as a tech company to help you, to help other election management bodies and uh, governments protect their elections. Um, and we do so by mostly through partnerships with groups like IFAS. Um, but we we think it's very important to work globally and we think it's very important to be entirely nonpartisan in what we do. Uh, next slide. So let's talk about threats to elections, because I know that's what you're what you're here to <laughs> to hear me talk about. Um, look, the the number one threat that uh, that is perceived, I'll say perceived. The number one threat is perceived is foreign malign hybrid threats. Now, a lot of that is directed at the largest democracies right now, right? The the United States. Uh, Brazil, the Western European um, democracies, but it's it's a global issue, and our friends in Russia um, are the main driver of this. Uh, I will say that when we look at foreign malign hybrid threats, we talk about Russia, we talk about China, we talk about North Korea, and we talk about Iran. Those are the big bad guys. Um, but Russia drives a lot of this, and I, I I would be remiss if I didn't really emphasize the point. The one of the largest inauthentic sources of media consumed in all of South America is RT Espanol. So that's just to give you a, a sense of, you know, the kind of influence operations that are out there. The Russians aren't just pushing what I'd call foreign threats to elections. They're trying to influence the the hearts and minds of entire societies uh, at this point, right? Um, and they're they're doing so by putting out both real media mixed with inauthentic media, so driving narratives that they want to drive. Um, and that's what we call foreign malign propaganda. Uh, we've seen a lot of intense foreign malign propaganda, often driven around specific events. Um, so you know. If an election's coming up, that's that's an event that that a, a for a generator of foreign propaganda would be interested in driving narratives around. Uh, we've seen particular issues in Canada, uh, the United States, Brazil lately. Um, cybersecurity threats are always still one of the the biggest concerns that that we see. Um, you know, but but I often emphasize that at least the the bad guys that we track. A lot of the cybersecurity threats that they are operationalizing, they're doing so in service of their own propaganda um, and deliberate influence operations. So those look like hack and leak or noisy hacks. Um, so it, this was an example in, in 2016 in the United States. The Russians compromised a voter registration system in the state of Illinois. They did so not to actually compromise the voter registration system. They did so to be found out. They did so to make noise, and it was all in service of building a narrative of distrust in institutions in the United States. And that's really, when it, you know, when we look at these things, when we look at cyber attacks, when we look at influence operations, it always comes down to destroying trust in institutions. That's the main goal of, of bad guys. And so I think it helps to frame everything that we think about, everything we do to combat these things with that in mind of their ultimate goals and in, in how they're approaching these things. Um, and I'd be remiss if I didn't note it. I, Tony said so in his opening remarks, AI is going to make the situation worse before it gets better. I think, um, you know, th now that we have a lot of uh, AI misinformation out there, you've, you've all seen uh, 
AI generated imagery floating around the internet. Um, it's, it's going to get worse before it gets better. It's, it's going to exacerbate the, the, um, disinformation problem. Um, but again, you know, we we do what we can and we're all working to, to combat that. Um, before I talk about the mitigation steps, um, I want to just mention here the other two things that I view, you know, we, we often talk about foreign threats to elections and that's great. Um, there's a lot we can do to combat that and we can work really closely with you in the room and with IFAS to combat that. But some of the things that um, I think people take for granted that are the, uh, I, I say the real problems um, are financial crimes and technical issues. So when we talk about threats to elections, um, one of the biggest issues that we see is really simple financial crime. Um, there are bad guys out there that are not Russians and not Chinese, and they are looking to compromise your systems with ransomware so that they can hold your systems for ransom and extort you for money. Uh, they're out there looking to compromise your email so that they can send you malicious links and transfer money out of your bank accounts. These are the actual attacks that we see uh, most often succeed against um, small government entities. Uh, so, you know, that's that's a big flag. And the other is simply misattributed technical issues. Everyone has technical issues. Every election management body has technical issues. How you communicate that and what your incident response plans are are critical to how the general population perceives the technical issues that occur. Um, again, elections are about trust. They're about making sure that people believe in their results and technical issues can do just as much harm as a foreign hacking operation um, if they're not communicated well and if they're not, uh, if incidents responses, they're not handled well. Fortunately, the solution to all of these things is more or less the same. It's to build technical resilience. It's to have plans in place uh, for incident response. And it's to work with groups like IFAS and us and Google to combat these things. Um, next slide, and, and you can skip the you can skip past that. So what are we doing to combat that? What what can we do to work with you to combat these things? Um, next slide. We talk about critical institution security. We have a program um, that that uh, protects email accounts. Um, Google has a very similar one that they'll tell you about in a second. Um, and we highly encourage that anyone in the room who is using our using Microsoft for email um, that you come talk to us. Uh, we have a program called Account Guard that's available in most of Europe and most uh, of the Western democracies. Um, it has not yet been expanded to any African countries, but we are absolutely willing to do so. We only need somebody to be interested and talk to us about it. Um, so please come to me and, and request it because I'd love to do that. Um, we are able to exercise our internal resources in the service of uh, protecting elections um, for free most of the time. Uh, which is great. You know, we have a lot of latitude from our higher ups uh, at, at Microsoft that let us uh, work with with you on doing assessments up front. So um, Matt will talk more about the our election readiness um, efforts, but I'll just say that it nothing makes me happier than if we're able to work with you to assess systems in advance. Um, you know, a lot of times people wait until the last minute to say, oh, there's an election coming up. We need to make sure we have resilient systems. We need to make sure we're hardening our security. We need to make sure we're doing penetration testing. Um, we want to do all that now when you don't have an election going on, because that's the best time. Um, and so they'll talk about that more later. But uh, I also just want to say, um, actually, next slide. And keep going. I think information integrity is probably the thing that um, that is most newly on folks' mind, especially in a room like this. And uh, I want to briefly touch on um, what we consider when we're looking at how to handle information. So we Microsoft is the depending on the the day of the week, we're we're one of the largest news aggregators in the world. Um, so it's you know when I when I say 
things like Russia's influence uh, in South America is driven by RT Espanol. Well, then it's on us to make sure that we're removing RT from all of our properties. That's hard. Russia will do things like um, spin up new versions of uh, websites with disinformation every single day under new domains. Um, and so we have teams internally that keep track of that, that work to take down that information every day. But we generally, we generally abide by the, the, these principles when we're dealing with, uh, with how to handle information. And that's freedom of expression. So we're not looking to censor things. We are looking to remove inauthentic content, but we're not looking to censor what is promoted on our networks authoritative content it's still our right to up rank things that we we deem authoritative so for instance if somebody's looking for information on elections in zambia the first thing that they should see is the elections commission of zambia and nothing else um that has been a problem in the past but uh, and it will continue to be a problem but us author elevating authoritative content is is one of the biggest solutions we have um, and then demonetization, making sure that the, the financial incentives for the bad guys to push out disinformation are not there and making proactive efforts. So working directly with you, if you have concerns over particular narratives, particular disinformation that are out there and working with us to remove them from our networks. Um, and I think I'm going to wrap up on that note and just say that I, I think uh, a lot of the other things that we do are um, are specific to the US and I don't want to belabor that, but um, I'm really excited for IFAS to tell you more about the project we've been working on with them. I think uh, there's a lot to be gained here from all of us working together uh, to build resilience and to combat uh, cybersecurity uh, threats and disinformation. So. I'll leave it at that. Dev, thank you very much. That's uh, Dev Lightman from Microsoft giving us an overview of the emerging threats, disinformation, and hybrid threats. We'll get to the next uh, session again. Our presenter will be joining us remotely, and this is no other than Aurora Bloom. Aurora, are you able to get me? Good morning. Yes, I can hear you. Absolutely. Thank you so much for joining us. Let me just quickly introduce you to the audience that will be listening to you from Lusaka, Zambia. So Ms. Bloom is a reporting analyst in Google's threat analysis group known as TAG. Before Google, she worked at the cybersecurity company Recorded Future and at the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, NATO, as a cyber threat analyst on the international staff. Her background is in international relations and cybersecurity. Aurora, over to you. Thank you so much for the intro. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, as said, my name is Aurora Bloom and I'm an intelligence analyst in Google's threat analysis group, also called TAG. Um, I'm calling in this morning from New York where I'm based. Um, First of all, I'd like to thank IFAS for inviting Google to be part of this important event and for your leadership in protecting democracies around the world. We're thrilled to be partnering on the shared mission of fostering digital security for democracy. Um, next slide, please. Technology has a vital role to play when it comes to the integrity of our elections. At Google, we've long created tools and resources to make it easier for people to vote. Our services connect voters with up-to-date authoritative information about polling locations, remote voting, election times. And during election cycles, we note that election commissions and campaigns are faced with increased security threats. One of the main threats to all email users, whatever service you use, is phishing or attempts to trick you into providing a password an attacker can then use to sign into your account. Our improving technology has enabled us to significantly decrease the volume of phishing emails that get through to our users. Automated protections, account security, and specialized warnings give Gmail users industry-leading security. Next slide, please. Google protects, Google blocks over 1 million phishing attempts every day. Um, on Gmail, we have certain security precautions to prevent spoofing, phishing, and spamming. Uh, we use email authentication to protect against email spoofing, which is when uh, email content is changed to make it look like the message is from someone or some 
where other than it actually is. We also offer advanced phishing and malware protection to administrators to better protect their users. By default, Gmail does display warnings and move untrustworthy emails automatically to the user spam folder. However, sophisticated phishing tactics can track even the most savvy users into giving in their passwords and credentials to hackers. That's where our advanced protection program comes in. Our advanced protection program protects high risk individuals. So this is election officials, uh, people working on campaigns, journalists, human rights activists, anyone with access to highly visible and sensitive information. So users who enroll in advanced protection program are protected against a wide variety of online threats. This includes sophisticated phishing attacks through the use of security keys for two-factor authentication, also against malware and other malicious downloads on Chrome and Android, as well as unauthorized access to any personal data, such as not only Gmail, but also anything stored in Google Drive or in Photos. Our teams work to equip campaigns and election workers with the best-in-class security tools. We collaborate with partners in Africa to give political campaigns access to free Titan security keys. This is the strongest form of two-factor authentication to prevent phishing. And just this past May, our Jigsaw teams announced a new initiative, Protect Your Democracy. This brings together a whole suite of tools like like this program in order to help countries on the front lines of the fight for democracy. We launched the initial phase of this program in Central and Eastern Europe, and we will be rolling it out to support democracy across the globe. As new threats are discovered, the advanced protection program evolves to be able to provide the latest protections to its users. Slide please. Thank you. A small minority of users in all corners of the world are targeted by sophisticated government backed attackers, otherwise known as APTs. These attempts can come from dozens of countries. Since 2012, we've shown very prominent warnings within Gmail to notify users that they may be targets of these types of phishing attempts. Um, this is what an account security warning would look like. A very small fraction of users will ever see one of these. Um, we also send alerts to G Suite administrators if someone in their larger corporate network um, has been the target of government backed phishing. We hope you never receive um, this type of warning, but if you do, please take action right away to enhance the security of your accounts. Um, the best way you can enhance the security of your accounts is by using good cyber hygiene, resetting passwords, using strong and unique passwords, using two-factor authentication through keys, um, and enrolling programs like advanced protection. Um, next slide, please. In the threat analysis group, we have an expert team using a variety of technologies to detect these attempts in order to notify and to protect users. We also notify law enforcement about what we're seeing as they have additional tools to investigate these attacks. Uh, you can see for all of 2022, 20, uh, we issued over 25,000 warnings. Um, we also regularly post public um, advisories to make sure that people around the world are aware of this risk. Next slide, please. So a little bit about our threat analysis group. Uh, we work to thwart cyber attacks. We are a global team um, that monitors and exposes espionage, hacking, phishing campaigns, and takes steps to disrupt those threats to protect our users. So TAG actually started with tracking government-backed attackers, but we've expanded to detecting, disrupting, coordinated information operations that are conducted on Google products, as well as uh, detecting and disrupting serious cybercrime networks. We work very closely with Mandiant, um, an industry leader in threat intelligence and incident response, which is now part of Google Cloud, as well as Google's trust and safety team. Um, the trust and safety team is the part of Google responsible for content moderation and counter abuse work. So a lot of our work um, on countering information operations is done with trust and safety. Um, slide, please. Thank you. In recent months, uh, we've stopped coordinated attacks by government-backed attackers from China, Iran, North Korea, and Russia. Um, and we also stopped attempts by serious cybercrime networks, as well as coordinated groups using inauthentic behavior to support information operations. Our role is clear. We help protect people and to prevent future attacks by identifying bad actors and sharing relevant information, not only with our partners, but also with the public. Next slide, please. TAG tracks over 270 government backed groups at the moment. In 2022, based on our, on our observations, the majority of government backed activity that TAG observed targeting organizations uh, connected with African governments was linked to China backed groups. Um, we track actually over 80 uh, government backed groups that we attribute uh, to China. And in 2022, we actually saw a small number of those um, directly targeting 
organizations involved in uh, government in Africa. And those groups, in addition to targeting government organizations, also targeted defense, higher education, high tech, media, and NGOs, often for information gathering purposes. Next slide, please. I'd like to take a moment to talk about the overall evolution of the cyber threat landscape that we've seen in the last year. Um, in 2022, we saw once again, an even greater number of countries and groups being involved in uh, the cyber threat landscape. These are groups that are um, being involved in cyber attacks um, or hacks for espionage purposes um, or for influence operations. Um, so this has uh, been a development over the last few years and it continues to accelerate. Um, even small nations or serious cyber crime groups can now purchase spyware, which is malware that and spies on you and exfiltrates your data, or even purchase exploits. Um, capabilities continue to grow, and one of the one of the threats of AI that has been touched upon um, is that AI can be used to make phishing campaigns um, more relevant or uh, seem more legitimate. Um, and some attacks are becoming even more sophisticated. Um, you can hear in the media a lot about zero days. These are vulnerabilities that attackers can use to access your system. Um, that haven't been patched yet. There are also something called zero-click exploits. These are vulnerabilities that are uh, very easy for an attacker to use without any interaction from the user. Um, we've also heard a lot about supply chain attacks, like the solar winds attack that affected the US government in 2020. But what I really wanna emphasize is that phishing and basic level attacks are still very common. Phishing is the initial cause of over 90% of cyber attacks. So even if further down the line, attackers are using um, a zero day that they've purchased, um, they're still accessing systems initially through phishing. Um, so it's best to um, best to address phishing in order to uh, address any of these any of these threats. In 2022, uh, with the beginning of the war in Ukraine, we saw in a new way how destructive malware is now definitively a part of modern warfare. Um, you can read a lot in the news about Russia's efforts to disrupt and degrade Ukraine's government and military capabilities. And we're actually seeing attacks on civilian infrastructure in an attempt to undermine public trust in government. Um, we're also seeing um, hacking being used for multiple strategic objectives. So the same hack can be used for espionage to steal information, to disrupt the system through a DDoS attack or through um, putting on fake ransomware. Um, and even for information operations. So taking the information stolen in espionage and using it in a hack and leak operation. Um, so this use of, uh, this use of um, one single incident for all of these different strategic objectives is where we think um, that the use of cyber is gonna to continue to evolve. Um, so quick note on information operations. Um, for TAG in particular, our focus is on coordinated information operations. So we disrupt these on Google products. Um, so what we look for is, is the activity covert in nature? Um, do we have a network of accounts who are misrepresenting who they are or where they're from? And are they inauthentically pretending to be a user to amplify messages um, for disinfo, uh, disinfo or misinformation campaigns? Um, that is just one part of a much broader spectrum of what people talk about when you hear the term disinformation. Um, disinformation can include anything from um, overt efforts from state-backed media entities or news organizations and a whole host of conspiracy, theory, of conspiracy content online. Um, we publish information on tag takedowns in what's called tag bulletins, and those are available uh, monthly, published publicly. Um, and we disrupted over 2,000 instances of this coordinated information operations activity. Um, Google also takes action to address dis and misinformation across um, in a much broader sense. For example, um, they took action to both demonetize and block um, Russian state media after the invasion of Ukraine, um, blocking recommendations for both for Russian state media such as Sputnik and RT. Um, now, from the groups that we track, we're not seeing as much activity on Google platforms as we were, say, two years ago because of our efforts. We are seeing more efforts on other social media sites and more fringe media groups um, to get their messaging across. TAG is dedicated to protecting users from threats from all advanced persistent threats. Um, and we actively monitor threat actors across the board and the evolution of their tactics and techniques and share that information both with our partners and with the public to protect our users. Next slide, please. 
We believe cybersecurity is inherently collaborative. Google is thrilled to be partnering with, um, with IFES to support their election readiness initiative so that election commissions can have security insights and tools that they need to stay secure. Um, and a good example of this, just recently, Google's Safety Engineering Center collaborated with the foundation to train high-risk individuals, including uh, people working in newsrooms and civil society on online safety ahead of Nigerian elections. We know there's more work to do and we're excited about our partnership and would love to collaborate with you all as leaders in this space to help empower election commissioners and commissions to stay safe online. If you'd like to get in touch or you have any questions about uh, any, anything in this presentation, please reach out to us through IFES. Thank you all very much for your attention. Thank you, Aurora. We have listened to presentations from the Electoral Commission of Zambia, Microsoft, and Google. And if you look at the last two presentations, like I said, they are highly technical. And basically, I can see our IT team smiling there because that was actually something they would understand. But like I said, um, this whole thing was to show us part of the infrastructure that they have that is able to deal with the issues that are being highlighted. I know very shortly we'll be joined by Matt, who's going to bring all these points home. All the technology, the science, and technical terms that we've heard after these two presentations, he is going to speak to us in a language that we understand and make us really get the points as uh, delivered. So ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, let me introduce Matt Bali, who's the Senior Global Advisor for Cybersecurity and uh, Information Integrity at IFES. So uh, Matt is uh, coming on to give us, obviously, from his uh, two decades of experience as policy advisor, uh, civil servant, technologist, and cybersecurity engineer. He has served as Digital Freedom Program Director at Penn America as part of the Biden-Harris presidential transition team and as senior advisor at the National Democratic Institute. He has also led the United States Chief Information Officer's policy team, and he holds an MA, that's a Master of Arts in Literature from Georgetown University. So Matt is coming over to take us through some of the innovative approaches that we can engage in combating electoral threats. Matt, you're welcome. Let's encourage him and clap for him, please. Well, it's a tall order to be intelligible about technology, but I'll do my best. Um, a small note of encouragement, I always include my education in literature in my bios. For anybody else out there who likes art and literature and doesn't like computers, you can do it too. Um, so just a couple of quick notes of thanks. I won't stand on protocol. We've, we've had many uh, thank yous and appreciations around the room. Uh, and it's hard to do in a room of so many impressive people doing such important work in so many countries. Um, I do want to thank uh, our hosts, including not only the commissioners and senior staff, but the, the line staff at ECZ, who worked very, very hard to make this event happen very quickly. I very much appreciate all of you and for uh, your willingness to co-host this event with IFAS. Um, I also want to thank in particular um, the esteemed commissioners from Namibia and from Mauritius, our good friends. Um, we're very glad to be here with you today and uh, we thank you for your participation and, and for your wisdom and your input. And um, finally, I want to thank also the speakers we just heard, our good friends Dave and Aurora from Microsoft and Google. Um, part of the reason that we had them speak first is so you could get a lot of technology words thrown at you. I was looking around the room to see how slumped people got as we talked about all these terrifying threats that none of us understand very well. The one thing I want to commend to you is these two uh, companies, but also the, specifically these two groups, TAG and the Advanced Protection Program at Google and Democracy Forward at Microsoft, these are good-hearted people whose mission is to help you in your work. They have incredible world-class resources at their disposal. In case it wasn't obvious from those, pr those presentations, all of those services that they were describing are either free to the world online, like the TAG um, uh, assessments that Aurora was mentioning, 
or their free resources directly to you to support your work, securing your EMB, CSOs that you're involved in or, or may support indirectly. These are free resources that are the best in the world because these companies have to be the best in the world because of the scale of the work that they're doing. So we're very happy to advise you always, and we're very happy to help you connect with these, these amazing, amazing um, experts and the resources they bring with them. Um, so I, I tried to have a little fun with the title. I feel like in, in the elections community, we're always very proper. Uh, electoral integrity under attack. Um, but what we want to do today is talk about innovative strategies, or at least directions that we as a community need to move in. And the most important word in this title is shared shared defense. We're very accustomed, because we run elections, and elections are national or subnational, to thinking about our threats, the things that we're worried about, as almost ending at the national border. Um, that's a, may have been fine in the past, that's a mortal flaw for democracy if we continue to move in that direction. So that's difficult, it's difficult to confront these norms and these uh, built-in structures in the way that we do our work, but this is my call to action today. The other thing is Dave was very kind in um, mentioning some work that Microsoft, Google, and actually a growing array of tech partners are doing all together called the Election Cyber Readiness Network. That's the second to last slide in my presentation, but you'll see that I'm building towards it. And my invitation will be for all of you uh, to engage with IPIS and to think about how we can bring that initiative to your region or to Africa broadly. Okay, so next slide. Um, so I have one big technology concept that I want to share with you today. It's called attack surface. So often when we think about electoral integrity, we think either in terms of sort of criteria, boxes that need to be checked in terms of the quality of the election, how it's delivered and perceived, or in terms of sort of process. How will the election be delivered? What are all of the logistical steps towards that? And in the end, were those steps delivered as they were anticipated and as they were communicated to the electorate? That's fine. In the world of cybersecurity, on our next slide, um, we often talk about combating threats in terms of attack surface. What is your attack surface? Your attack surface is all of the points in your operation or in your systems. These could be computer systems, or they could be buildings, they could be other companies you work with that could potentially be attacked in one way or another. Um, we unfortunately see not only cyber attacks, but physical attacks, assaults on poll workers, assaults on um, infrastructure, um, and we see disinformation attacks. So any type of attack on any aspect of your operation or other operations like media operations that you may depend on for delivering an election that has electoral integrity. So the question I'm, I'm posing here may be obvious. When we think about electoral integrity, either globally or for your particular country, what all is within that attack surface? Um, let me bring that down to earth just a little bit on the next slide here. So examples of attack surface. Um, this is a classic, an oldie but a goodie, ballot box snatching. So the ballot box is part of the attack surface, right? You're worried about whether there will be any problems with that. That could be snatching or it could be some other issue. And it's susceptible to multiple types of attacks, one of which Goldie oldie is ballot box snatching. But as we move into more modern attacks that we're probably more worried about in most contexts now, um, hacking of EMB websites or other systems like uh, results management systems or public portals. So an unfortunately common attack that we see now is defacement of the main EMB website. Even if it has nothing to do with the election itself, hackers will break in, uh, put up some obscenities or some anti-democratic messages or partisan messages. And what does that do? It's just like Dave was saying about the attacks on the voting systems in uh, the state of Illinois in the US. It creates a credibility problem for the EMB and for the integrity of the election as a whole. Even if there's not such a big problem, it's just not a very well secured website. So the attack surface here is the website. The attack is hacking, but the impact is actually on electoral integrity. You with me so far? Okay. Um, and then last but not least on this list here before I give you some very concrete real examples that we're going to move through really quickly, but the, the point is to overwhelm you. Um, disinformation. So we see not only um, actual hacking of election systems, 
but we see alleged hacking, disinformation about hacking of election systems. We've seen this in um, the two biggest, most recent African elections. We see this in almost every election around the world now. It's part of the playbook. You don't have to actually hack into the system if you can just convince people not to trust that it wasn't hacked into. This is, a, as I say, a mortal flaw for electoral integrity. So in this case, what's the attack surface? It's not necessarily the system. It's the information environment. It's the media landscape. It's social media. So this is my point. When I talk about the attack surface of electoral integrity, we're not just talking about the websites or the information assets, uh, IT systems, the trucks, the ballot boxes that an EMB directly controls. We're talking about all of this entire space that impacts the perception of the integrity of the election, including, say, Facebook, uh, YouTube, Twitter, all of these assets that are completely beyond your control or perhaps need to be brought into closer coordination. So let's go through some real world examples just to bring this down to earth. Next slide. Okay, so there was talk about spyware earlier. This is a map, it's actually quite out of date. It's from 2018, this is from Citizen Lab, an amazing NGO in Canada. They've been one of the lead organizations uh, investigating at a very deep forensic level the Pegasus spyware, NSO Group's Pegasus spyware. I'm sure you've all read about it. This map, again, it's five years old, so more countries would be lit up and they'd be in darker colors. Um, but it shows everywhere there are known or suspected Pegasus spyware infections led by state-backed attackers. Um, Africa is not accepted here. Um, I'm happy to show you this on my laptop so you can see it a little closer um, after we get through the event. You could probably take a smart guess about where some of the early adopters are. This map has only continued to fill in since this time, and I'm at pains to say NSO Group is one of half a dozen similar organizations providing similar capacities that are in active use that I could name off the top of my head. So this map is meant to show you something about our attack surface, which is your citizens, what are they doing to access information? They're looking on a smartphone. What smartphone is that? It's either Android, or it's an iPhone. Pegasus, uh, at least in the iteration that we're, we're talking about here, exploits uh, a, a vulnerability in iPhones. And so that attack surface that we're worried about here is the iPhone operating system, and it's impacting directly the integrity of democracies and thereby elections globally. So this is what I'm talking about. This is the scope of what I'm talking about that EMBs need to start thinking about protecting their, their environments from and as potential threats to their, their environment. So we'll move through the next few more quickly. Um, next up, I already mentioned social media. I'm sorry, on the, the previous slide. Um, this is, there's a good report here from um, Yale that's worth looking up, talking about the special difficulties for content moderation in Africa. It's very useful. It talks about a mix of geopolitical issues, linguistic and AI related issues, um, and essentially like business environment issues. It's really comprehensive and it's very useful in trying to understand um, why specifically African countries across the continent are so ill-served relative to other countries and other regions around the world. Um, and then just a specific example of a, a current ongoing difficulty, Meta had outsourced most of its content moderation in Africa to a single firm located in Nairobi that firm recently decided not to renew its contract. And just like that, lights went out for a great deal of Meta, Facebook, Instagram's content moderation for the whole continent. This is the sort of issue that is not just a national issue, it's a regional issue that confronts all EMBs, all democracies at once. And so there's a real question there, what is our role as an election community in helping reduce that threat to our shared electoral environment? Um, next. Um, here, um, we'll come back to this, but um, one of the other things that we're seeing is specific disinformation narratives are being copied and pasted from democracy to democracy. So in the US, there was some disinformation about an election technology vendor, Dominion Voting Systems. That narrative is being copied and pasted. We saw it pop up in Brazil. We saw it pop up in Australia. 
uh, even though there are, uh, we were talking with the Australian Election Commission, there are no Dominion voting systems. There's not one single Dominion voting system on the continent of Australia. It does not exist. And yet you still had disinformation narratives saying these machines are going to be used to hack the vote. So this is an example of how the information space becomes a shared attack surface for all democracies, even though uh, it can seem specific to each election or, or special to each election. Uh, and I think last but not least, one more. Yeah, and this one I'll, I, I won't go deep into. Um, the Commissioner for Mauritius knows that this is my favorite topic. Um, the other issues is that we have what are called data brokers, scooping up a great deal of information off of our websites, off of our phones, and reselling that. It's being used for surveillance for, by uh, authoritarians and autocrats. It's also being used to micro-target disinformation globally. Um, on the right is a screen capture from a great uh, analysis by the Philippine um, news portal Rappler about micro-targeting and reputation laundering in their most recent election. So um, all of this is just to say we ignore all of this at our peril. We're not used to talking about these issues. Um, raise your hand if you have more than one disinformation analyst on your team at an EMD. There are no hands in the room, right? Raise your hand if you have one true cybersecurity expert on your team. With due respect to any cyber people who are holding the, holding the wall for their, their whole country. We're not accustomed to budgeting or staffing for these issues. This is a mortal flaw. This is a huge problem, and it's one that's collective in nature. Um, raise your hand if you have engaged in, if your EMD has engaged in one regional initiative about these issues in recent memory. No hands are up. This is the problem that we need to confront. OK, so I think on the next slide, we get to be happy. Yes, we need innovative and shared strategies. So I'm just going to pose three, three high-level ideas. These are not meant to be comprehensive in nature, but they're designed to help us start to think outside of our traditional sort of silos and boundaries with regards to elections management and uh, threat prevention. Uh, next slide. OK, so I'm going to. I'll introduce these here and then very quickly touch on them uh, one by one. So first, this one may be obvious from what I've already said. We need to treat this digital aspect of our attack surface as a top electoral integrity concern. That means integrate not only budgeting for it or considering it, but integrating it into all of our other activities that we do from planning to incident response to auditing and sort of after action review or, or analysis. This needs to be comprehensively integrated throughout and thought of alongside real world threats, political threats, uh, corruption threats, and the like. Two, we need to invest in not only communication strategies, but what the Australian Election Commission has started formulating for themselves as reputation management. The critical difference here, they have a great guide on this, the critical difference here is it means proactively communicating and managing the perception of your organization, your EMB, and also democracy throughout the election cycle, not just during the campaigning window or immediately before, during, and after E-Day. So this much more proactive stance and with a specific eye on what is the public perception, what's the level of public trust and confidence in elections and in your EMB. Uh, and with that crisis communications, this is a distasteful topic. Many EMBs sort of shy away from it and say, oh, we won't have a crisis. We all have crises. You have to plan for it, know what you're going to do if and when the crisis happens, such as disinformation, ballot box snatching, whatever it is. And you have an explicit capacity in place and an, and an action plan in addition to your reputation management and traditional communications. We'll come back to that as well. And then finally, and this is where the Election Cyber Readiness Network comes in, we need to find ways as a community to engage much more robustly with tech companies. These could be local in your country or your region, but certainly with these tech giants that are part of our shared attack surface. And then we really need to get more comfortable with and create legal, constitutional, and normative structures for uh, collaboration amongst EMBs and our core stakeholders within regions. I'm going to move through these very quickly, but I'm happy to share all of these resources after, after the event. So on the first point, this is about integrating digital attack surface. I just have two things to share. Next slide. Um, the first is, uh, the reason I asked who's feeling comfortable right now, who's happy at the beginning, is because I know none of us are. It's really hard to find a starting place. Um, 
Uh, IFAS has recently worked with USAID, uh, with support from USAID and consultation, throughout a series of five s guides that are designed to take you and also USAID's DRG officers from no understanding of what cybersecurity is to a good, informed, working understanding of what the biggest threats are for elections specifically, what hacks have happened, what have not happened, what is the actual state of play, and what are the immediate first steps, second steps, third steps you can take to start building this capacity within your organization. So I highly commend these to you. Um, members of my team wrote these. I think they're brilliant. They're very easy to read, at least relative to this, this topic. Um, and if you're feeling overwhelmed, you can almost say, okay, step one, download one of these guides and read it, or ask one of my deputies to read it. Step two, reach out to IFAS and get connected with IFAS plus uh, Google and Microsoft. If you do nothing else after today, that's, those are the things I would take away. Um, on the next slide, I just wanted to give you an example of what integration of the digital attack surface looks like. So this is from Kenya. There's an amazing uh, CSO there called Kiktonet. They focus on ICT issues as they relate to democracy. Um, I was there along with members of our, our Nigerian Africa team observing on election day in August. And I saw these very nerdy looking people taking notes and observing. And I said, they don't look like normal election observers. They're from Kiktonet and they were doing digital observation. So they did a pre-election analysis and shared their recommendations with, um, with the EMB, with IEBC. Uh, then they were out with clipboards, seeing how the technology, the Kim's kit and other things were working. Were they working as intended? Was the process being followed? And then they did an after, action, an after analysis and that's what's screenshotted here. So this is all integrated very, very tightly with the traditional election obser observation activities. And um, notwithstanding all of the difficulties that Kenya has faced after the election, very well integrated with IEBC's um, uh, reception from C CSOs of, of recommendations for how to strengthen their process beforehand, and then also their, their activities following the election. Okay, next up, and I just have a few more slides. I know I've been long. Okay, so the next topic was not just comms, not just having a communications team, but having reputation management throughout the election cycle, and then having a specific crisis communications plan. I think I've frankly already discussed that at great length, but I want to just refer you to a couple of resources. So on the next slide, um, this is what it looks like. This is the, the reputation management strategy from the Australian Election Commission. I really recommend you take a look at it. They're lucky to be a very well-financed EMB relative to most in the world, so they've been able to really invest in this approach. Um, it's worth a read. They've published this online. It's very easy to find. Um, it's just called Reputation Management Strategy. If you, go, if you type that in in AEC, or we can send it around in a link. And just to see how they're reformulating this for their operations and integrating it, I think is very, very powerful. And I would commend it to all of you. Um, and then next up, uh, on the question of crisis and strategic communications, please come find IFAS. We have great resources on these. We're about to start publishing uh, a number of guides related to not just social media, but crisis communications. We'd be happy to talk you through the fundamentals. Okay. Um, oh, and, and last but not least, um, this is an example of, of what kind of really extending your social media and media monitoring capacity can look like. I won't go into this in great detail, but this is a screenshot from a custom AI-driven tool that IFAS built. Um, and provided directly to an a, um, African EMB to support their situational awareness and crisis response through a recent election. So it's monitoring overall levels of social media traffic related to that EMB specifically uh, in local languages. And it's also using the AI to determine how much of it is offensive speech, uh, harmful um, calls for violence, hate speech, and actual incitement, incitement of violence. So I'd be happy to talk about that as well. This is the sort of thing that we need to start thinking about as, as core to our operations. Okay, last but not least, this is where I promised I would get you Election Cyber Readiness Network. Uh, next slide. Um, well, let me just say a couple things first about engagement with the tech sector. Um, these, are, these are five principles that I'd recommend to everybody. Uh, EMBs are often rightly very careful about engagement with any type of industry, any type of corporation. Um, I think it's very critical for each, each of you to start thinking about how, what protocol you can use to increase your engagement with the tech giants. This is a sketched out protocol that I would recommend. Um, the first is, as you all know, preserve your autonomy. 
Um, while we're excited about all of these free programs and free advice and sometimes free software that the tech companies can provide, it's critical that you know that you could walk away from that support at any given time. Um, this also means if you have technology vendors who are providing these services, that you know if there's a problem with them, you can walk away at any time. What's your, what's your escape plan if you need one? Um, two, we've talked about AI. It's a really important thing. Uh, this time last year, we were talking about NFTs and Bitcoin and blockchain. Um, there's a real tendency for tech topics to be part of what's called the hype cycle. Everybody gets excited about it. It feels very urgent. You, you take all of your five uh, dollars you have to invest in tech this year, and you put it on that, and it turns out it didn't really matter that much. So it's really important to be wary just because everybody's talking about a topic. Is it actually a concern? Is it actually relevant to your attack surface? How do you do that? Uh, it's actually number four. You need to find trusted advisors. Ideally, these are people that you can bring directly in as employees, long-term staff. But you need people like IFIS, local technology advisors who are not trying to sell you anything, who can help you understand where are the real threats, where, where have you underestimated your attack surface, where there are emerging issues that are going to matter a lot two years from now when you're holding an election, and can help you figure out where to put those $5 and how not to waste them. Um, and then the last two kind of go together. The first is demand localization. Um, one of the things that happens with the global tech companies is for reasons of cost efficiency, basically. They really like to ship uh, content moderation, AI, whatever it is, one global solution for everybody in the world, as if all cultures are the same, all political environments are the same. Part of your job as elections, as elections commissioners, as elections um, management body staff, part of our job as people who support you is to say that's not good enough. It must be localized, and we don't just mean to Africa or Latin America, we mean country by country by country, and even election by election. This is something we all need to come together. It's part of the, that threat environment I was talking about. And so rehearsing, knowing who your trusted advisors are, and then demanding localization about what they think are the most important issues, this is the, the, most, the most important thing you can take away. Um, and the last thing I would just say, and I think it's obvious from the remarks that um, Dave and Aurora made, they would agree with this statement. Elections technology is not just Dominion, Smartmatic, your Kim's kit, uh, your, your authentication system. It's any technology, social media platforms, Microsoft Office, that represents part of the attack surface for electoral integrity for your country. So if it is technology that is a potential, has a potential impact on the election, it is elections technology. It is within your remit. And it's something you have a right to make demands about how it functions and how it works in your space. OK, here we go. Last, last and not least, Elections uh, Cyber Readiness Network. So this is brand new. Uh, when I, I put the little highlight over new up there, because I'm very excited about it. Um, we're actually launching this not today, but in about two weeks' time in Prague. Um, so we're working with, uh, with initial support and operational coordination from the, the companies you just heard from. There are several more. Um, that we're just in the final stages of approval to bring on all of the major tech giants to create the Election Cyber Readiness Network. The basic model here is to bring together regional cohorts of EMBs. The first one will be in Europe and Eastern Europe. Um, we're looking at potential cohorts in Africa, hint, hint, uh, and also in Asia Pacific uh, and in Latin America. Bring together these cohorts to do a few things. One, peer learning, demystify these issues. Two, um, we've heard the term threat intelligence here. Um, law enforcement agencies, um, security agencies uh, that you work with, perhaps, are very used to receiving highly technical information about hacking, about disinformation, about other types of vulnerabilities like Pegasus. And they know what to do with that information. When they get this information from Microsoft or Google or from Interpol, whoever it is, they say, OK, this matters to me, this doesn't, if it matters, what are we going to do about it in terms of our risk mitigation, our crisis communications? We're not so good about that as an election community, and we tend to rely on those services. Through ECRN, we're going to build threat intelligence channels directly to EMBs so that they can use that information as part of these overall operations to protect the attack surface. But we know that that's a, there's a big um, amount of capacity we need to build, whether that's staffing or just knowledge building. 
And that's what we're going to do through these regional cohorts. Um, and then the last thing we're going to do through this is the thing that we started with, which is to think about what is the shared attack surface for this region? What are the, the shared issues of concern that could impact all of our elections over the next one, two, three, five years? And what advocacy do we need to do, whether it's to our parliaments or to these tech companies or to the international community or to our local CSOs to help combat these threats? So that, that point of agreeing what the threats are and then coordinating a response for defense to it. So um, I'll leave off here. Um, would you mind just advancing to the next slide? These are just those three principles again, just to, to underscore them. Um, in case it's not obvious, we're really, really excited about these issues. We think that they're overwhelmingly important uh, and really, really look forward to working with all of you to hear what you think, what are you working on, how can we help, and how do we take these from a completely overwhelming set of techno babble and jargon to something that feels obviously something that's actionable for you and in your mission and in your coordination within your country and your region. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Matt. Just to indicate that we'll have a networking session and part of the plenary over lunch. For now, we do realize there are some people in this meeting that need to transition to meetings taking place elsewhere. So we just want to have the closing remarks and then um, allow those that are going for other meetings to leave. And in giving um, some uh, wrap ups and closing remarks, allow me to invite Mr. Abdul Rahman who currently serves as electoral commissioner in Mauritius. This is the position that he has held since 1998, as we heard earlier on. In this role, Mr. Abdurrahman monitors democratic processes with electoral supervisory commission to make sure that they are free and fair. He has also served in the legal capacities during his time as Mauritius's judicial office and attorney general's office. Mr. Rahman has also led and participated in numerous electoral observation missions across and outside Africa. He is a member of the Executive Board of Association of World Electoral Bodies and also the founder of REOI. Mr. Rahman earned his barrister at law from Gray's Inn in London, United Kingdom. You're welcome, sir. Let's encourage him to come. Good morning, Mr. Chairperson. Good afternoon. Sorry, we already passed 12. Mr. Chairperson of the Electoral Commission of Zambia, the Vice Chairperson, and the Commissioners of the ECZ, uh, my good friend, Mr. Anthony Banbury, also known as Tony, <laughs> and Mr. Mark Billera from uh, USAID, and my dear friends and colleagues from the Election World. What a depressing morning. <laughs> well, what are we doing here as election commissioners? Aren't we, are we in the right job at the right time? I think we should have got better things to do in our life. When I started in 1998, I did my first election in, in 2000, and we didn't have to deal with all these UFOs from outer space trying to attack us, and staying, we're staying in the corner of a room, and being attacked, we're subject to attacks, cyber attacks, all sorts of bullying, and uh, we have nothing to respond to except for the wise words and solutions of our friend Matt here. Hopefully, they'll come to fruition in the, near, in the very near future. In the good old days, we had a small fraud in the, ballot, uh, in the voting room or in the counting process, but nothing as we are facing today. So we have to be equipped. We have to be ready for these <coughs> few challenges facing EMBs. I'll try and run through the morning session. And uh, we, had, we started with the Tony himself, Mr. Banbury is uh, opening address, and uh, he congratulated the ECZ, who's taken the lead for promoting and consolidating democracy in the region. We also, he spoke, also spoke about new threats to democracy in this ever-changing <laughs> environment, and very serious challenges <coughs> to the integrity of elections in this part of the world and beyond. As he said, there is no, no democracy is perfect, 
we all try to we all try to achieve and improve the democratic processes in our jurisdictions. And the most important thing is to be able to speak with each other and share best practices. Mr. Banbury sp also spoke of a rapid spread of disinformation in the election world, companies that sell misinformation and undermine the election process in general. We also spoke of a challenge to the role of electoral commissions in this world of misinformation, fake news, and hate speech. We are all committed to democracy and how technology is threatening democracy and electoral integrity. We must all come together as EMBs with support from external stake stakeholders like IFRS, like we said, to be able to address the challenges facing us. The growing risk of technology creates significant security risk as well, including cyber attacks, and we need a sustained cooperation among global electoral integrity stakeholders, and this is urgently needed. I shall now move very briefly to the <coughs> address of the chairperson of ECZ. Madam Chairperson, I was delighted to, ha to have the opportunity to partner with IFS for this a networking event, a historical event taking place in Africa, and as it was mentioned earlier, the same event is taking place in various parts of the globe, in Costa Rica, in the Netherlands, in South Korea, and in, in Washington itself. Mr. Chairperson also talked about ways to combat threats to the integrity of elections in this part of the world, and the need to uphold the high standards of integrity in elections. And this was recognized by the ACZ in its approach to the last 2021 general elections in Zambia. Electoral integrity is critical, and Zambia has conducted seven general elections and two presidential elections since the return to multi-party democracy in the country. Zambia has also a robust electoral legal framework, including the Electoral Code of Conduct, <coughs> and we take into account and recognize the observations and recommendations from various stakeholders which once implemented improved electoral processes. One innovation that we did to, to add to the integrity of the process in Zambia, which is very interesting, and in Mauritius and in other parts of Africa, we haven't yet achieved that very laudable uh, objective, is that persons in custody and correctional <coughs> institutions have been registered and have voted for the first time in Zambia. That is a very great thing for human rights in this part of the world. If I may now move to the presentation of Mr. Musanga, from the acting CEO of ZEC. He started with an overview of the threats to electoral integrity with a specific reference to Zambia. The ECZ has been established by the Constitution, which confers its independence and protects it from outside interference. A stable democracy in Zambia since the return to multi-party democracy, and the ZEC has managed democratic transition <coughs> in 1991, 2001, and 2021. Yeah, I think it's a sheer coincidence after every 10 years, it's like a 10 year cycle when we've had democratic transition in this country. 1991, 2001, and 2021. That's yeah, very interesting. I hope we won't have to wait for the 2031. <laughs> we see democracy at work. People vote and their vote counts, isn't it? Yes. I think that's one of the your motto here. Your vote counts. Yeah, so the people speak and the people bring to power who they want. And uh, the acting CEO also talked about strides to enhance electoral, electoral integrity. The press photo registration which cap captured about 7 million people last time. And. Uh, <coughs> The conversion of streams to polling station aimed at enhancing efficiency and transparency. And also he spoke about the registration of people in, in judicial custody for the first time in the history of Zambia. Voter turnout in Zambia in 2021, the last election, was 70.52%. And it, there was a timely announcement of presidential election results within 69 hours and also the enhanced participation of stakeholders, monitors, and observers. I think this is, again, this is a very good practice. It brings credibility to the election process when you have observers and 
domestic uh, monitors to can monitor the, the, uh, the election process. We see you also spoke about threats <coughs> to the process here and the attempts to stifle political party campaigns, the perceived uh, attempts to stifle political party campaigns, the lack of uh, adherence to the actual code of conduct by some political stakeholders, and unprecedented electoral petitions, 84 in number. We are not the only one. We are about 16 in our small island, and uh, that's about three and a half years on since the last election in 2019. We are almost at the eve of the next election, and we still have to do the petition at the Supreme Court. So it's ongoing, an ongoing process. It's a new phenomenon, I think, in many parts of, this, of the world where we have to face petitions with no substance, unfortunately. No substance at all. It's a waste of time for everyone, for the court, for the Supreme Court, for ourselves, for our lawyers. We have to deal with that for many, many months. But I think that bringing grievances to the Supreme Court is a very good thing. I think it's a good thing. It adds purity to the system. It adds purity to the, to the process because people know they have a safety valve. They can go to the Supreme Court and the judgment of the Supreme Court is accepted by everybody and we move on from there. We have suppose, also spoken of uh, some political violence. <coughs> uh, thank God it was few and far between, which, which was prompted in some senses by, by some candidates campaigning and this prompted the ECZ to ban some candidates from campaigning. And so I'm happy that you have the power to suspend and to ban people from campaigning. And this is a very important attribute of an independent electoral commission to be able to, to ban and suspend some people from campaigning if they have misbehaved and they have been found to have misbehaved. We also talk about the low confidence levels of the institutions, the polarized media landscape, that affects many parts, uh, many EMBs in uh, in Africa and beyond, which because they report along party party lines, unfortunately. Whatever we talk to them about, whatever we discuss with them, whatever we brief them is not important at all. They have their own agenda and they push the agenda forward to the detriment of the integrity of the election process. Some reflections by the CEO the le on legal precedence, on the need to extend voting franchise to people in the diaspora and also ICT in election, which is seen both as a threat and an opportunity. Electoral integrity is central to ECZ, and ECZ will seek to adopt ways of enhancing the integrity of the process in this country. I now move to the presentation of Dave Leichman, the Director of Corporate Civic Responsibility at Microsoft. He spoke about threat to elections, the Democracy Forward Initiative, which is to preserve, to protect, and to advance the fundamentals of democracy by promoting a healthy information ecosystem and safeguarding open and democratic processes. <coughs> Dave Leichman also referred to threats to democracy. Cyber, cyber security is a big threat. Disinformation is the number one threat to election processes. And he also spoke of how to maintain a healthy information ecosystem and also preserving journalism and addressing the issue of media literacy among the youth. He also spoke of protecting democratic processes and institutions which are critical to ensuring resilience of democratic societies. We have also heard from him about perceived foreign malign hybrid threats and cyber security threats which affect all of us. He said he ended on a very pessimistic note, unfortunately. He said it can only get worse before it gets better. So we have to be on our guard. He spoke about the need for information integrity to increase societal resilience against disinformation and build resilience and to combat cybersecurity threats. See, and this is, I think this tied up very nicely with what Matt said. We're going to so, uh, start something very soon in Central Europe and hopefully this will be a good uh, springing board for all of us to be able to use in the future to be able to, uh, to address the few challenges facing us as EMBs. 
I move very briefly to the presentation of Ms. Aurora Blum, which uh, did an overview of emergency, emerging threats. So she talked about cyber, cyber threats and election security, uh, sec election security threat landscape. And the Google's advanced protection uh, program, which helps keep private information safe. In 2022, we had over 25,000 warnings and the most targeted country, of course, was the US. We also have government-backed attackers and the greater number of, uh, of uh, groups, attacks are more sophisticated now. They can be destructive and the malware is part of a modern war warfare trying to attack EMVs in many countries. Use of cyber operations for strategic objectives. And I come lastly to the presentation of our friend Matt in person today. He spoke about the actual integrity and the attack and the innovative strategies for, space, for shared uh, defenses. I think at the end of the day, as EMVs, what we have heard today is the key words that have been talked about this morning in this morning session were, I, I just uh, try to summarize it, the sharing, the collaboration, the working together, and learning from each other. This is the only way we can move forward because today is not the end of a journey for us. I think it's the beginning of a journey that will take us to address challenges collectively and jointly, because if we all work single-handedly by ourselves in our small corner, we will not be able to achieve great things. We have great partners like IFAS, who have been at our side for many, many years, and in this very complex area of cybersecurity, of threats, of cyberbullying, I don't think we have the expertise in this part of the world. We need external, stake external stakeholders, and I believe IFAS is the right partner to be able to work with. I think Madam Chairperson spoke about her belief, her trust in partnership. She values partnership, and I will end on that note, if you don't mind. I think we need, the, the takeaway today is to have valued partnerships with stakeholders we can trust. IFAS has been in the business for a very long time. I think we can all trust IFAS. We can work together and try and bring solutions to our ever-growing concerns, because this Cyberbullying, the cyber attacks, is not going to leave us right now. It's going to stay for quite some time, and we need to be fully equipped to be able to deal with these sorts of new challenges facing us as EMB. So, if I've taken the time, thank you very much for your attention. Have a very good day. Thank you very much. Let me quickly invite the Vice Chairperson of the Electoral Commission of Zambia, Ambassador Ali Mwinga, to come and uh, close. Let me just also read his brief bio. So Ambassador Mwinga is an advocate of the Superior Court. He holds an LLB degree from the University of Zambia and qualifications in urban and economic development from Galilee College, Israel and public sector management from Stockholm, Sweden. He's an associate member of the Institute of Local Government Administrators in Zambia and served as a member of the Willa Mungomba Constitutional Review Commission and the National Constitutional Conference. During his illustrious career, Ambassador Smwinga has worked in various positions within the public sector that include as town clerk for both Kitwe and Lusaka city councils. He was appointed to serve as uh, ambassador to the Arab Republic of Egypt, where he was also accredited to the Republic of Algeria, Iran, Iraq, Syria, Lebanon, Tunisia, and the state of Palestine from 2014 to 2017. In 2018, he was appointed as a member of the Electoral Commission of Zambia, and in December 2022, he was appointed vice chairperson of the Electoral Commission of Zambia, Ambassador Smwinga, sir. Uh, the chairperson of the Electoral Commission of Zambia, Mrs. Mwangala Solomis, my lady, Justice Anistali, my Lord, Justice Martin Musaluke, 
visiting chairpersons and I've recognized my sister from Namibia and others that are present here, members of the Electoral Commission of Zambia and staff of the Electoral Commission of Zambia and other visiting uh, colleagues from other EMBs, Mr. Antoine Banbury, the IFS President and Chief Executive Officer, distinguished resource persons and expert presenters present, esteemed invited stakeholders, ladies and gentlemen. We've come to the end of the summit for democracy ECZ side event on innovative strategies to combat threats to election integrity. I'm sure you will agree with me, colleagues, that the presentations and remarks have been extremely been enriching, passionate, and interesting too. I was privileged, as you saw, to be seated next to my lady, Justice Annie Stadi, and my Lord, Justice Martin Musaluke. And I was very, very impressed with the manner they were taking their notes. They were so serious that I thought at one time that they were writing their usual scholarly judgments. And that, in itself, I think, demonstrates how interesting the presentations have been. This side event, chairperson and distinguished members present, has explored the various internal and external multifaceted threats presently confronting the electoral management bodies, including, of course, our own Electoral Commission of Zambia, in the increasing complex geopolitical, social, cultural, economic, technological, security, and disinformation context on the continent of Africa. These challenges, as discussed today, are real, genuine, and global in nature. But I believe that the responsibility to address them still rests with each electoral management body. I believe that this session has helped participants to appreciate why it has become a daunting task for the Electoral Commission of Zambia and other AMBs to build institutional resilience and its implications for integrity in elections, and how electoral stakeholders can come together to combat these threats. Madam Chairperson, distinguished stakeholders, ladies and gentlemen, the Commission believes and acknowledges the value of elections as fundamental to the entire democratic process. The Commission also recognized that for elections to achieve the objective of having legitimate representation, it is necessary to have an electoral system that is appreciated by the electorate and stakeholders, and that facilitates their meaningful participation in the electoral process. That is why, Madam Chairperson, ladies and gentlemen, the Electoral Commission of Zambia is extremely pleased to be part of this important side event. I would like to say how much we've enjoyed being here during today's program. We have several times experienced great moments which we have shared, moments that I believe will live in our minds forever. We've thoroughly enjoyed listening to the ideas and messages of these truly wonderful people who are prepared to give so much of their valuable time to all of us at the tremendous sacrifice to themselves. On behalf of the Electoral Commission of Zambia and the staff, I would like to thank all of you and indeed our presenters for having brought together a really special group of people, people who are prepared to say this is our cause too. We thank you for your attention, we thank you for your attendance, and we wish you the best. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Vice Chairperson.